Good afternoon, day of Pentecost, full gospel church. So good to see all of you this afternoon on this beautiful Sunday afternoon, the first fall Sunday, and um, the first Sunday we now have an operating website, and uh, in case some of you have not realized, we have a website. Let me see if I can get it right. D O P F G C dot org. I think I got it right. Which stands for Day of Pentecost Full Gospel Church dot org. It is up and running. It also will be evolving because there are some more things that will be added. You will be able to link right to the website. Uh, the Zoom link for our services are on there already. So if you go there, it'll show you the Zoom link. And uh, probably after today, the link for the service will also be uh, connected to uh, the Zoom, uh, to the web page as well. So I wanted to share that with you. Those are the wonderful things that are happening now as well. For our scripture this afternoon, I want to call your attention to Matthew chapter chapter 6 and these are the words of Jesus a lot of red letters in these chapters Matthew chapter 6 starting at verse 25 And I'm only going to read a few of those verses. But the verses that I'm going to read are about trusting in the Lord. It has to do with teachings on worry. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. <clears throat> Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And as I thought about that, I remember an uncle <clears throat> that told me one time, if worry could solve anything, then we could all go and get jobs in worry and get paid, and there would be no more worry. And I had to think about that a minute. As my Uncle Lewis told me that, because not Anywhere have you seen worry solve any problem? 
But Jesus always also said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. For my Semitic scripture this afternoon, I 
I want to call your attention to one that's right about in the middle of the Bible. Psalm 119. We're going to verses 40 through 50. Psalm 119, verses 40 through 50. We find these words in the Bible hymn book. Well, the book of Psalms is the hymn book of the Bible. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. <clears throat> Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me for I trust in thy word and take me, take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth. For I have hoped in thy judgment, so shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and I will not be ashamed. I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved. And I will meditate in thy statutes. Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction. For thy word hath quickened me. My topic what I long after. Now this afternoon we will look at what a deep craving for God's presence does for us. And what benefit is there in longing after the things of God? And I want to ask you this question, will your longing after the things of God provoke others to long after them too? Now, as I was thinking about this a couple of times this week, <clears throat> after I left work, and on my way home, I was thinking, what do I feel like fixing for dinner? I don't know if you've ever gone through that. Now, everybody that knows me knows that I can cook and I like to cook. And sometimes when I've got a lot on my mind, I do a lot of cooking. Sometimes, sometimes I cook when I'm stressed. Sometimes I cook when I'm happy. And sometimes I cook just because I want to try something new. Sometimes I cook when I'm mad. Sometimes I cook when I'm sad. 
Sometimes I cook when I'm happy. I, I just love to cook. I love to cook almost as I, much as I love trains. The only problem is loving to cook. I also have to watch where I put what I've cooked. <laughs> so I've worked hard at governing where I put what I've cooked. So I've lost a few pounds, thank you Jesus, and working on losing a few more. But have you ever been to the place where you've had a taste for something and not really know what it was you wanted? Yeah. Or wake up in the middle of the night and have what I used to call and a phrase I learned from my, my grandmother, been a little peckish for something to eat. And you couldn't think of just what it was you wanted. And sometimes it might cause you to go and stand there with the refrigerator door open, just standing there looking. Like you're waiting for it to talk to you and tell you what it is you want out of it. Or open up a cabinet Looking in the cabinets, waiting for something to jump out at you or just grab your attention. And you might walk from one cabinet to the other. Or somebody might ask you, well, what it is you think you want? I don't know what it is. I want something, but I just don't know what it is. Now, maybe you haven't done that before, but... I have, or you, you would taste something and say, no, that, that ain't what I wanted. Or have you gone to the grocery store? Now, one of the things I note, I'm going to say this as a sidebar. My mother used to always say, don't ever go to the grocery store hungry. Because you will come out of the grocery store with everything but what was on your grocery list. And then when you get home, you'll be miserable because I bought all this stuff that I really didn't need and didn't want. But you'll go in the grocery store wanting something and you'll walk down every aisle with the basket in front of you just looking. Just looking. Now, years ago, they used to have folks standing in the aisle that would offer samples of this or that. Now, there's one place that still does that. I got a membership at that place, and I said, oh, they still do this. They used to do that as a child, and they would have these little samples with toothpicks in them, and it would be just enough to get you enticed to go and buy the product. And when I got my membership at the store, and I'm not mentioning the name because I'm not doing advertisements, and some of y'all might know one of the stores I'm talking about or the store I'm referring to. It would make you then go to right where they were selling that stuff and they would usually set up that little stand, I call it the stand of enticement, right near where they had a whole rack of what it was they were selling. 
And they would say, oh, it's on sale for such and such and so and so. Oh, really? And then they might hand you another toothpick when they saw your interest. And, oh, try another one to hook you in. And if you were just the least bit hungry, you might go get one, maybe two of what it was they were selling. And sometimes you get home and say, you know, I really didn't need that, but oh, the way they had that with that toothpick in it tasted so good. And when you find that one thing that hits the spot, you sit there and you eat until you're satisfied. The salvation of the Lord is kind of like that. Because you know, sometimes we have searched high and low for something that would satisfy us. The song, Fill My Cup, says, like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that would not satisfy. But then I heard the Lord speaking. Draw from my well that never runs dry. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill it up. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up until it overflows. And you see, when the salvation of the Lord fills you, when you find that that one thing satisfies that hungering in your soul that nothing on earth can satisfy, that's the one thing that hits the spot. Like when that earthly hunger you find they satisfy and you sit there and when you get that satisfaction, you can't put your finger on how it satisfies but it just goes all through you. It does something that just goes through every part of your being. And you sit there and sometimes you make noises. Mm -hmm. I had a friend one time and I had baked a ham. See, I have a special anointing I put on a ham. Secret family recipe with the glaze. There's only a few of us that know the glaze recipe. And when you fix it just right, and I had baked this ham, and I had sliced it up, and she said, what's that you put on there, Reverend? I said, it's the family recipe of glaze. And she said, can I put some more? I said, let's dip some more of that glaze on there. And she sat there, and she was sitting there, and her husband the pastor that I had to come and preach for me that time, he was sitting there and said, Honey, what you doing? She said, I got to get me some more of that glaze on this ham. And she sat there and she put it in her mouth and she went, mm -hmm. And I just smiled because it had hit the spot. But you see, there was a, she just kind of twitched like she had gotten up quickly. But you see, there's something about when the Spirit of God moves on you and gives you that kind of quickening that satisfies deep down in your soul, just like that one thing that you love when you eat it. It just does something deep down in your soul that you can't put your finger on. That's what that salvation does. And that scripture tells us that the salvation of the Lord answers the reproach of the enemy. You see, there is something about when you 
really come to know the Lord, you can't put your finger on just what happened when the Lord came into you and changed you, but you know that you know that you know that he satisfied something deep down in the depths of your soul that you never want to go back away from again. That's why I believe the scripture tells us how can we neglect so great a salvation? Because when you've been set free, why would you ever want to go back into the prison of sin? Because now, as it says in the rest of that verse, it says, because you have trusted in the word of the Lord's mouth in the rest of verse 42. And you're going to keep his law, it says in verse 43. You will keep his law, his word utterly in your mouth. There's sometimes when you taste something, you just don't want to stop chewing on it. It's like watching a cow chew its cud. It just continues to chew and chew and chew. And then on top of that, there's something else about that salvation. It's because not only it answers the reproach of the devil, I now have hope in Christ because he has never failed me and never will. I, he has a track record with me. You see, I have some folks that I know, and sometimes, because they're human, they will sometimes let you down. But Jesus has never failed me. He's never failed me. His word says he would never leave me or nor forsake me, and he never has. So I have hope in Christ. And I know that he is good for his word because of what he has done so far. And because I can trust in his salvation. And because I know what he has done. And because of that, that longing that he's given me like that deer that pant panted for the water. He's given me a holy boldness that makes me not ashamed, as Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. And the older I get, the bolder I get. It seems like the more I'm in the Lord, the bolder I get. That I don't care who knows or what they think about it, this is where I stand. And as I told you last week, I'm digging my heels in now. Because I don't care who knows, and I don't care what they care about it, this is where I stand, as the old hymn says, on Christ the solid rock I stand, and all of the ground is sinking sand. Amen. There's something about a holy boldness that you get when you really are longing for the deeper things of God, and you just won't let go. Call it my Jacob syndrome that caused him to change my name. Because I said, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. And even after you bless me, I'm still going to hold on to your unchanging hand. Because I'm longing for more of him. I want to walk continually 
in his liberty. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I preached a sermon not long ago on how we are free to move about under the anointing. Because now we are free to move about under the liberty of the Lord. And because of that, I meditate on his word and his goodness to me. For when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I tell you, I can get up in the morning and I don't have to think back very far. I can think back just to the night that I slept through and see that I woke up this morning and I still got a pulse. I can, can put my glasses on. I might be nearsighted, but I can still see. I still got breath in my body and I might have a little ache and pain, but I can still move about. And I didn't see my name in the obituary and I know it's going to be another good day. I can think of his goodness to me and my soul can cry out hallelujah, praise God for saving me. I've got another day to serve him, another day to praise him, another day to lift up holy hands, another day to cut a step for Jesus. I might not cut them like I used to, but another day to praise. Amen. Another day to sit to witness for, for him that maybe somebody might come to know him. Amen. Mm. And when I think about him, the part I like that it ends with, when I think about him, there's a quickening in my spirit that my soul just leaps for joy. And sometimes I think what's happening is my soul knows that one day I've got to leave here. So every now and then my soul starts jumping like, oh, it, oh, oh, it go in one day. It gets a quickening. Because it identifies that this is not my home. This is just the temporary place where I have an ambassadorship. But one day, I'm going to be called home. One day, we all got to leave here. But while I'm here, I got work to do. But every now and then, I get a quickening when I get a phone call from heaven. And it's Jesus just quickening my spirit to say, just touching base with you to see if you're still on the line and you're still serving me. Yeah, Lord, and I'm not going anywhere because I've come too far. Hey, oh, I just got a quickening just now. Come too far to turn back now and I'm not going back. Oh, sometimes the quickening just comes in a smile when I think about how far he's brought me. Sometimes I get a quickening when I get excited when I think about what he's got in store. I get a quickening when I think about what he's doing right now. I get a quickening when I think about anticipating souls getting saved. I get a quickening when I think about anticipating folks getting more of God, I get a quickening. When I think about folks getting filled to overflowing, I get a quickening. When I think about somebody getting healed, I get a quickening. When I think about someone getting delivered, I get a quickening. When I think about somebody getting a breakthrough, oh, oh, praise God. What I long after is one day I'll hear him say two melodious words. Two words I want to hear him say. Well, Done. 
then as I remember a cousin, the last words he said on this life, my cousin Foster, my dad's first cousin, the last words he uttered in this life, after I hear those two words, I want to be like him on the other side. When the rejoicing starts, I want to say his words. Let the music play. Let the celebration begin. Oh, let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, let somebody long after that closeness with you, let somebody in the sound of my voice realize that there's more to just sitting on a pew or watching it on a video or on a laptop or listening to a few songs. But Lord, you want to get deep into someone's life and have an intimate, close relationship with them and revolutionize their lives. And Father, I just, I just got this vision of how I've been teaching kids about the founding of a nation and how the forefathers put their lives on the line and at risk to birth a nation. But Father, that doesn't compare to how in your plan you sent your darling only son to earth to put his life on the line and die on a cross for a sin-sick world. And all we have to do is put our hope and our trust in him and say, yes, Lord, I receive it. And you would say, now is the day of salvation for you. If they just but ask you to come into your life, Lord, let somebody do that and confess you as Savior. This is my prayer and my hope in Jesus' name. That is my story. And I'm sure enough sticking to it in Jesus' name. Amen.